Hello and welcome to the Cyber Cultures Podcast, a short series designed for students in communication and media studies at the University of Wollongong. My name is Dr. Christopher Moore, and today's topic is the Internet of Things, or IoT. Joining me in the Cyber Cultures Bunker tonight is Dr. Ted Mitev, a colleague in Digital Media and Communication major and a researcher in Internet Studies, who's also one of the most interesting people on the planet. Welcome, Ted. Oh, thanks, Chris. So let's start with the obvious question. What, what is the Internet of Things? Uh, yeah, let's, let's get rid of the obvious first. So uh, the Internet of Things at the very basic level is simply uh, the connection of all sorts of uh, objects from household appliances to random uh, furniture, clothes, wearables to the Internet. So this is the basic entry-level description of what the Internet of Things is. And uh, uh, because I'm a researcher in the Internet of, the, of Things, I will uh, uh, obliterate this description right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there's three things uh, wrong with this uh, description, and, and they are the words uh, Internet and of, of and, and things. things. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the first thing is that uh, this is not the Internet anymore, right? We're not in Kansas anymore. This is a radically different uh, network than the one we're used to. Uh, why do I say that? Because uh, the internet that we know of is uh, uh, subservient to humans, you could think of it that way, in the sense that it initiates on demand and we are kind of we have construed ourselves within it and the network is such as something that uh, we use to access information, right? So uh, we are the, uh, um, the subject Right, the active subject in this relationship and the internet, the network is, is passive in the sense that it only uh, answers to our demands. Uh, even though our computers or mobile phones have to constantly maintain some sort of latent connectivity in order to maintain the network. So uh, the internet of things is something radically different because things are the subjects, right? So uh, they initiate the connectivity is not us anymore. So this is not the same internet. Um, the second problem, the, the, the notion of off, right? It's, it's wrong because um, uh, it should be rather internet by things in the sense that uh, um, uh, the primary connectivity, the primary density of communication, the primary semantic exchanges on this internet will not be happening uh, between humans and things, but between things themselves. Um, and uh, uh, down the track, I'll, I'll give you examples of how this uh, uh, hilariously looks in practice. But uh, uh, for now, it, it's, it's important to understand that uh, it is uh, uh, th this network is constructed by things and uh, is enacted by things talking to each other primarily. So humans are, uh, by definition, here of secondary importance, right? Um, and finally, these are not things uh, as we uh, have been thinking of, uh, in, in, at least in the West, uh, for the last, I don't know, 2,000 years. It's this, this, uh, these objects that uh, uh, become part of this new Internet of Things are, are not really the things we're used to. Uh, so, for example, I'm working on a research project right now connecting clothes to the Internet. Um, and we're developing this concept of peer-to-peer -peer clothing. Uh, so, so these are not primarily clothes, right? These are primarily sensors of, the, of, of uh, different aspects, right? Sensors of uh, uh, heart pulse, uh, of heart rates, sensors of galvanic skin responses, sensors of proximity, uh, sensors of movement, and only secondarily clothes, right? Similarly with, uh, let's say, a, a milk bottle connected to the internet. It's not a milk bottle primarily. It's a sensor for... Uh, milk level in a bottle, <laughs> right? So it's a sensor for for uh, consumption. So to take that back to the idea of the clothes, it's it's not really clothes with sensors, but sensors with clothes. Exactly. I mean, you, you could already see that in practice with uh, the, the cars we uh, we are rolling out today. I mean, they're primarily computers which move around as opposed to cars with a computer on board. And they're increasingly entertainment systems with wheels. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, the, the, it's important to understand is that uh, this is a paradigmatic shift in terms of how uh, networking occurs, how communication occurs, because uh, um, the primary 
movers and instigators of uh, uh, communication will be objects talking to other objects, not objects talking to humans or answering to humans. To go back to how you described the the, the internet there uh, as being responding to humans, are we are we talking about a shift in an act uh, of an internet shifting from a kind of responsive internet responding to humans to a, a kind of constantly active web of connections or are we talking about something that's more passive and responding to proximity okay we can take a step back now and i can answer this is a fantastic question i can answer this with uh, the history of i mean how we how we came here awesome. uh, uh, the first you could say conceptualization of what what we are now describing as, a, as an ascent internet of things came uh, by a guy called mark weiser um, who was a, a brilliant computer scientist uh, from the States who developed this notion of ubiquitous computing, Ubicomp. And he, he imagined it because at that time it was simply a conceptual uh, uh, you know, exercise. It was speculative uh, design, if you will. He imagined it as something akin to a, a, a fully sentient environment where you know the walls the carpet the ceiling the lightings uh, the furniture are all connected to the internet and are all in a passive uh, uh, state of anticipation for the uh, humans uh, human interlocutors right so you would enter this kind of environment and the environment will quietly passively try and satisfy your needs and you can see i mean you can see how naive this was in a way and uh, I mean, I, I always joke about it that, you know, that Mark Weiser was a brilliant computer scientist, but he understood very little about how technology actually works, right? I mean, isn't that an advantage in, in thinking about yeah, speculative design? Yeah, he, he was um, imagining uh, everything as, a, as, as the passive receptacle of human agency, which would simply answer, right? And it will remain passive, right? It will, this is a glitchless universe, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? And, and, and anyone who has spent any time on the internet today knows that glitch is the internet aesthetic par excellence, right? So this tells you all you need to know about this uh, imaginary uh, uh, of uh, uh, ubiquitous computing as developed by Mark Weiser. So this is the one, you could see the one uh, conceptual trajectory, right? This, this kind of environment, which, you know, the doors open, the lights uh, automatically adjust the mood of the room based on your heart rate, the music plays based on where you are, right? It attenuates itself based on your exact location in the room, etc., 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 right? So uh, it's, it's a very strange kind of puritanical, I don't know how, how else to call it. Uh, where everything uh, answers imagine. to the human. Exactly. Everything answers, the human is the pinnacle of this environment. Uh, whereas is, is the God in that environment? Exactly, exactly. Whereas what we are uh, um, seeing now is the exact opposite. We're seeing objects which are, uh, I call them in my research, heteroclites. You know, they're actively transgressing the boundaries we, we give them, right? They're actively uh, uh, having a, a voice. Uh, objects which are um, uh, more enchanted than uh, invisible, right? Objects which appear to be like magic, uh, uh, as opposed to objects which just blend in the background, right? Um, uh, Mark Weiser called that calm technology, right? He imagined the environment as calm, quiet, and hidden, right? A technology is completely disappearing, obfuscated in the background. Whereas what we see now is radically opposite. Yeah. And it's not because of some strange... Uh, 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 logic of technology is because we need technology to be visible. I'm thinking of the uh, the, the robotic vacuum cleaners that yeah. come out uh, cleaning when there's when there's no activity. The idea was that initially they would come out when we're not around, but in fact we actually enjoy their presence and enjoy having them in our homes. Let me let me hook on to that that notion about um, speculation because in this subject uh, students are looking at the difference between the way cyber culture and the future of technology is represented in popular culture and the and the the difference between the way we're actually experiencing that change the the kind of things that we've seen in terms of this kind of technology might be you know an app controlling the lights or an app that controls your stereo, for example. But we haven't really seen in Hollywood or television 
um, a, a real kind of vision of the of the Internet of Things. But we've seen, you know, 3D printing, we've seen virtual reality. Why not something like this yet? I have a few theories. <laughs> it's a great question because, you see, on the one hand, I, uh, I mean, theory number one, I think our imagination, especially as it, uh, when it comes to deal with technology uh, at scale, right? We're not talking about technology in the lab, but technology at scale when it's already scaled up for mass consumption. So as, when we imagine technology at scale, we are... Uh, confronted by the poverty of uh, uh, you know our imagination because we are we are, we are uh, construed within this suburban environment. Mm. So mm. You, you think of technology at scale of this uh, this kind of fantastic uh, science fiction of technology. In, in what what do you ima imagine? You imagine suburban homes, right? Yeah. And oh my God, I can open my garage remotely, right? It, it's almost the internet. Yeah, the internet of things is amazing. Right? I yeah. can open my garage. Remotely, right? <laughs> so it's 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 ludicrous. Right? It's so impoverished, and uh, uh, there's so much more to this than simply um, home automation. And yet, this is the vector that uh, uh, big uh, companies are using because it is the easiest vector. This is the path of least resistance, and this is a, a bigger philosophical problem with uh, our current. Uh, um, system of production and consumption that we we always kind of herd it into these path dependencies where the path of least resistance e ends up uh, uh, um, domesticating us. Not only domesticating, but, but dictating how technology would develop. Yeah. So, for example, uh, all big uh, um, internet corporations, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, um, working on producing their own fully self-enclosed, fully coherent home automation systems. I noticed Telstra just announced their own kind of central home network. And, and this is exactly this, right? I mean, when, when uh, cloud computing started uh, uh, coming on the horizon, if you remember, uh, also everyone wanted to be in the cloud. Yeah, or in, uh, even Internet 1.0, right? It didn't gain traction until yeah. we started to get it into the house, into the home. So uh, the technology will be developed inevitably along these tracks and um why not industry why not factories why not or oh, as I do, I do i was thinking of one episode of doctor who in which there is a, a forest that's melded with technology and so it's a, an internet forest um but there's so there's, so, there's such a, a a lack of imagination uh this is a, 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 a it's a correct observation by all means, and it's also a, a very deep uh, problem because the the issue here is not so much lack of imagination, um, I would say, but uh, the fundamental problems that come with our patent and copyright system, yeah. which uh, you know the the IP system is as it exists today is used to curtail and, and uh, uh, literally prohibit straying away from path dependencies in the sense that uh, um, huge swaths of potential applications are patented, right? conceptually locked down and never touched again uh, because that, the competition might go there. right? And then path dependencies are kept and then everyone just jumps into that. So what we see now is huge amount of innovation and tinkering at the absolute periphery with uh, open source uh, hardware uh, like Arduino, uh, where people are doing all sorts of strange applications, which connect, you know, connecting objects to the internet, collecting, uh, connecting objects to each other. Um, but uh, the main trajectory is uh, home automation. So it's not accidental that Google bought Nest. Um, and uh, funnily enough, it has been a total failure for them because clearly they don't know how to integrate Nest within the existing model. Google, anyway, Google doesn't do yeah. social very well at all. See, the, it, this is another story uh, altogether. It's, a, it's another conversation, but uh, uh, it's interesting because Google's model, their frame of reference, their, their internal paradigm of coherence, if you will, is oriented around the cloud and around uh, uh, leveraging uh, uh, this, this meta uh, level of understanding of the data in the cloud. Uh, whereas uh, they don't do objects, <laughs> they don't understand that yeah. that thing. So uh, they bought Nest because it allowed them to extract a lot of data from homes, right? When it comes to thermostats and uh, uh, you know temperature regulation, they imagined that this would link to uh, power uh, uh, um, smart power meters and uh, things like that. Uh, you know, smart air conditioning, etc., etc. Uh, 
and, and they failed. Totally. Interestingly enough, the only one company so far of the big, you could say the big five, right, um, uh, of the internet, the, the, the only one company which uh, has had uh, tremendous success when it comes to entering the Internet of Things and designing, defining the parameters is, is Amazon with uh, uh, the Amazon Echo, right? It's yeah. also known as Alexa. And this is a, a device that, that sits in the, in the home. It's designed for yeah. the home again. Uh, and it has microphones that pick up voice commands. Um, is, does it have other sensors? So, what's, uh, so the Alexa is, is like a, it's a cylinder around uh, 20 centimeters high. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's a, first and foremost a, a powerful microphone, mm. uh, but also a powerful speaker. Um, and there is a computer with network Bluetooth, obviously. Yeah, there's a computer uh, um, uh, on board with, with network connectivity, which allows it to stream uh, live to the cloud. And what is really important here is that Amazon managed to bring down latency to under one second. So uh, any commands or any interaction with Alexa takes uh, less than one second to go to the Amazon cloud and return with the answer. Right? It takes me longer than that to type. Yeah. So... Uh, but this is not the killer app when it comes to Alexa. So what the brilliance of Amazon, what, for example, strangely enough, Google clearly could not comprehend, uh, and let alone uh, uh, Apple and Microsoft, is that they immediately, uh, at the conception point, opened up Alexa to everyone. As an open source device? Yes. So everyone can make apps for Alexa. Uh, the, in the, they don't, they, smartly enough, they don't call them apps, they call them skills. Nice. So everyone can teach Alexa a skill. new skill. Everyone can upload their own skill to Alexa, right? And uh, uh, teach Alexa and all the Alexas in the world to acquire the skill immediately. So I got, I got goosebumps then because the idea that you can teach an object skills there you go. is something that really resonates. I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. And, and initially they started with, uh, I don't know, I forgot already, around 40 or 50 and now they're in the thousands. And we'll keep growing it yeah. exponentially as yeah. users grow. I'm, yeah. I'm very taken with that. You hit on um, uh, an interesting point about some of the barriers to the development of the Internet of Things, uh, namely copyright and intellectual property and how open source is, is a clear winner in that direction. What are some of the other resistances? What are the, some of the other roadblocks to its development? See, the biggest uh, roadblock right now is... Uh, uh, scaling, right? Scalability. It's not bandwidth. Uh, not so much. No. Um, I mean, Alexa is a great example here because you know you can leverage uh, the entirety of the Amazon cloud. You can order. People have taught Amazon the skills to, for example, order pizzas. Uh, uh, you know, play music, answer questions. You can. Uh, she. <laughs> there you go. Personification. Yeah, right? yeah, the opposite of com technology. So Alexa can order you. A, it's already an a, entity. A, a Uber. It's not only an entity. There are fan clubs for people who are in love with their Alexas. Oh, that's right? awesome. There's, there's people. There are communities of people who are deeply in love, have deep emotional attachment with their Alexas. Um, it's it, it, it's amazing, right? and it shows you where the actual trajectory of the Internet of Things is. I've, right. been, I've been saying this about objects for, for ages, that objects need love. And one, one of the ways that we um, forestall planned obsolescence is through the love of these devices. See, Bruno Latour, uh, the founder of Art Network Theory, has this uh, uh, famous saying, or infamous, depending on which side of the divide you are, that uh, technology is relentlessly moral. And, and my version of that is that, you know, objects love you relentlessly, <laughs> right? They're, they're relentlessly sociable. They're like puppies. They're... There you go, right? <laughs> and they, they don't take no for nothing. Right? They just, you know, a, a hammer is always a hammer and always looks for nails, right? <laughs> so uh, when it comes to um, Alexa, there's a, there's a famous uh, example here from the very recent uh, past when uh, uh, a local uh, TV station in uh, California was uh, having a show where for one reason or another, I, the details are not that important, uh, the TV host said, Alexa, buy me whatever, you know, buy me this chocolate or whatever. Live on air. Yes, and tens of thousands of Alexas, right, in households which had this program on air, immediately purchased <laughs> this item. Right? So you had all these people suddenly discover. So what does this tell you about the comb technology idea, right? How, how comb is that? Yeah. <laughs> how is that comb? Right? So it, this, is a, this is the 
where we're going. And, it, and it's, So presumably you could teach a lecture to ignore the radio or ignore the television. And, and, and now it becomes interesting because you realize that uh, you need to develop semantics for object denial, for the objects to deny you a request, right? I mean, how yeah, cool, yeah. How so, cool so, is that? Yeah, right? I, I would love, I would love an iPad that knows when bedtime is. And it so, tells you, forget about it. You, yeah. you know yeah, what yeah, you're yeah, yeah. My, my is off. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I'll see, you, I'll see you in the morning. Here's a lullaby yeah. to to put you to yeah. sleep. And another five minutes, I'll switch off the headphones as well. Right? Yes, <laughs> yes, please. All right. So we talked about some of the the um the kind of wondrous elements of, of the Internet of Things, but um there's a common uh, fear. Uh, a common moral panic about devices running amok. And we're going to be looking at um, texts in, in this um, subject that play out these fear in Hollywoods from, you know, right back from the war games, uh, the Matrix, any number of really bad sci-fi thrillers. Should we be concerned about the Internet of Things? Absolutely. However, I just want to... It, it's, it's not the devices that... Uh, and it's a common, it's a common moral panic that uh, uh, you know Hollywood and popular culture, uh, you know, very carefully stalks continuously. It's not technology that runs amok, right? Uh, technology is simply, I, I mean, I call it in my research ossified agency. You know, it's agency which is uh, which is hardened, concretized. Yeah, concretized, and, and it stays the same. Yeah, right. And As you said about the hammer, stays exactly, the hammer. and it repeats itself into existence. So. Uh, it's not technology that that is the problem here. Um, it's uh, it, it's how we deploy it and the context within which we deploy it, and uh, fundamentally, it's us that is the problem. Like with the Alexa, it wasn't it wasn't Alexa's fault that it ordered this device. It was the person broadcasting the instruction. So uh, yes, and in and I mean, obviously, you can reframe it the other in in another way. You can look at it as a problem of uh, design in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, the fact that Alexa is constantly, I mean, you can switch it off, but the default mode is constant listening, yeah. right? So it's relentless attention, right? You have Alexa's undivided attention 24 seven, right? As long as there's electricity, always. So uh, you could configure, you could look at this as a design problem, but you know, it, it shows you an undermining future uh, uh, in terms of uh, privacy, in terms of surveillance, in terms of uh, uh, data ownership. Right, because all of this data captured by these devices, not necessarily Alexa, it can be a Fitbit, it can be your internet uh, connected clothing uh, or whatever, all this data goes somewhere else. Right, so uh, in, in my research, I, I, I call this a kind of hierophanous moment because the, the data that is collected by the device, whatever that device might be, is from the perspective of uh, the human uh, interlocutor of the device, uh, that data is transcendental. It disappears. And then it returns, uh, and, and you have no say over its return. Right? It returns almost like the, it's, it's like the will of God, in a way. Uh, that's the trans so, transcendentality. And, but the problem is that it's not some bene bene uh, uh, benevolent uh, deity, right? It's a, it's a corporation yeah. in charge of the data. So the biggest problem when it comes to uh, uh, the downside, you could say, of the Internet of Things is uh, our total... A lack of uh, uh, sophisticated taxonomy of data, right? We do not have one, right? We still have this primitive private public. Uh, we do, do not differentiate between different types of data, different usage scenarios of data, right? Different, uh, 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 you could call spherical rings of um, privacy that you might want to deploy depending on the scenario. Right? We, we totally lack that. And this problem escalates when you are looking at data in aggregate. And uh, this is another problem yet again when it comes to the Internet of Things because um, uh, we as a species really suffer and struggle to, to think in terms of aggregates. Uh, and it's very easy for, um, uh, you know, when, when, when you talk to uh, students and you ask them, okay, so you have no problem with sharing this data online. And they say, yeah, of course, I have nothing to hide. The problem is that they... they uh, uh, totally unable to think in aggregate in terms of this, this data gaining predictive powers once they start accumulating it uh, uh, in stacks. So um, this, is, this is where the idea of the panopticon comes in. Jeremy Bentham's idea of the perfect prison, where 
uh, the the guards are watching us 24 7 but we can't see that they're watching us and so we automatically modify our behavior in order that we don't do anything wrong and be disciplined it's a it's a disciplining of the body it's a disciplining of the soul um, are we at risk at creating a digital panopticon absolutely yeah that's most definitely a risk uh, precisely because of the uh, obfuscated uh, uh, status of data uh, it, it is it is not not simply a problem of ownership it's a problem of access yeah and it's a problem of agency based on access is this where open source comes in again the, because we're so used to devices that are closed that we can't see what's happening you know it, the, the term is black boxed um, but this is also true of data, data, data and information is also black box. We, we don't know where it's going. We don't know how it's being processed. We don't know what the algorithms are doing under the hood. Is this where our open source is, is, is the necessary key? So we, we always know where our data is going. We always know where it's ending up. I mean, I know that's not a magic bullet. Uh, listen, it's, uh... It's a little bit like the difference between Android and, and uh, uh, the iOS in terms of the, your powers to configure the system and tinker with it. Uh, there is no; these are not binary states with you know uh, uh, plus and minus. You know, there's this uh, almost infinite variation and in, of intensities when it comes to uh, how uh, good it can be and how bad it can get. Uh, the issue here is, and it's an issue of principle is that uh, at any time you should have complete control over how that data is used right and uh, if you want to give access to marketers to that data you should have that right but if you want to deny everyone you know accepting your family the access to your data you should have that right too and we simply don't have now we don't mm. have that taxonomy of, of intensity of access right and In what fact, is facebook has intensified the opposite that yes. we're used to just giving away our data all the time in exchange for access to communities, to, to social networks. And, and what people don't get uh, is that uh, the, the point I made earlier, that it's not only access, but it's, uh, it's also the, uh, the meta level of access, which is the kind of agency that can be exercised based on access. So uh, can, can I only access your data or can I resell it, right? Or if, if I can only access it, what kind of algos, what kind of algorithms can I run on it, mm. right? Can I uh, extract metadata from your data or not? Can I just have a, only a look or can I extract stuff from it, right? And do I then have a right to access what you've been doing with it? There you go. So the one of the big issues that, uh, again, people have in terms of conceptualizing uh, the, the downsides of the Internet of Things, and they're truly scary if you go down that path, is that uh, uh, this kind of uh, aggregate data stacks have uh, uh, almost unimaginable, from our current paradigm's perspective, uh, uh, predictive power. Right? So uh, whoever leverages that data, for example, Amazon with Alexa, uh, gets uh, uh, tremendous predictive power over future behavior. And predictive power uh, translates to uh, potentiality for control. Another example of this, and a practical real-world example of this, was in Victoria, uh, when I was living there about uh, four years ago, uh, the power companies were introducing smart meters. So no longer did the, ele uh, the electric company have to come onto your property to read the meters about how you were spending you know, your electricity, but they could just walk down the street and with a simple Bluetooth connection, they could read the, um, the power meters set on the poles. Now, um, a lot of people were concerned about this because they were afraid that, not, not about individual control over individual houses, but rather that on aggregate, the, electric, the electrical companies could charge some suburbs more for their electricity than others. Um, yeah, and, based and so on location. Based Absolutely. on location. Yeah. Uh, or based on usage patterns, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and oh, you want to use your air conditioners more this yeah, summer? Yeah. Well, we're going to hit you in, in this suburb, but not in this suburb because Absolutely. our investors yeah. live in this suburb. Yeah, there you go. And uh, uh, returning to back to your question, because you, you started uh, uh, this with asking me about uh, potential, I mean, what is uh, slowing down the uh, unfolding of the Internet of Things. The other... Uh, 
uh, thing apart from the copyright patent uh, uh, situation and you know the IP being used as a control mechanism right for innovation um, the other uh, problem and you could you could see how it's connected to that is uh, the fact that you have competing uh, protocols uh, which, um, which which is always the case with new technologies the thing is that uh, you have uh, different uh, shifting consortia being uh, developed between uh, the lesser powers when it comes to uh, uh, the internet and when it comes to uh, uh, networking. And uh, these are consortia which are trying to impose uh, their own proprietary protocols on uh, the, the nuts and internet of things. This is one of the major successes of Tim Berners-Lee in that he was able to uh, establish a, you know, a primary standard for internet protocols. Corey Doctorow um, has a famous kind of joke where he says, you know, when we get together to decide, you know, how to regulate, you know, all these different protocols, all we do is end up creating a new protocol. You know. and, and you know, the, the, there is only one answer, of course, and it should be an open source protocol. <laughs> and it should be free and it's not because we should be communists but it's simply because this is the only protocol that scales up to infinity simply as the, as the tcp ip protocol demonstrates up there and it's also because this is the only way to ensure that all bugs are removed as quickly as possible that innovation happens as quickly as possible around this protocol in terms of hardware in terms of software building on it right um, and it's not accidental that uh, the alexa is the first internet of things object to to explode in terms of scaling up, right? Because uh, the skill set of Alexa is open source. But you hit on a really kind of uh, interesting moral panic around open source, which was that notion of communism and socialism. That's why I said it. <laughs> that, that, that this is this is a um, this is why why Amazon is so important in this environment because they've clearly showed that you know by sharing your intellectual property, your products can succeed. And what's really interesting for me, I mean, that's probably not really related to that conversation, is how come Google lost its way so spectacularly because. The promise there was that they will leverage their success with Android, which is an open source platform, uh, on mobile, and uh, they would simply push that and extend it into into the so-called uh, household internet, right, and, and uh, household automation, and and they failed spectacular. It, it has been a total mess, right? and it's fascinating how. It, so it clearly, the ideology in the corporation informs this decision making. So you have a sign how a corporation can lose its way spectacularly fast based on. Uh, a change in philosophy right? and again ideology trumps everything else <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's uh, start to, to, to head in the direction of wrapping this up but uh, before before we do I wanted to you you talked a, a bit about enchanted objects and I, and I, I really wanted you to, to elaborate a little bit more on 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 what that means so see enchanted objects is a concept developed by a, a guy from uh, MIT his name is David Rose uh, MIT by the way is the uh, is, is the, the, the motherland if you will of uh, the Internet of Things that's where the concept was first developed uh, in the MIT media lab in 1999 um, and uh, uh, so David Rose wrote a book and proposed that uh, uh, contrary again to, to uh, although he's trying not to be too critical um, he's far too polite uh, uh, contrary to what Mark Weiser was uh, was imagining uh, the Internet of Things uh, goes in, is going into a direction where you have these uh, objects behaving in strange and, and often magical way so he proposed a, a, a overarching framework for defining these objects called uh, enchanted objects because they bring enchantment to life so he, he built a taxonomy uh, in that book, and I strongly recommend everyone reads it, uh, of different kinds of enchantment, uh, using a lot uh, of uh, having a lot of inspiration from uh, uh, folk tales, from uh, uh, one of my favorite examples from that is the magic mirror, where you you have uh, not only like a constant readout that seamlessly fits into the background, yeah. so you can see the temperature, the time, the barometer, whatever but that you can have your wardrobe projected on it. So, you know, I like, I like to choose a different t-shirt every day. So I could, I could have an object that says, no, you wore this one yesterday or, you know, last week at the same time, or, or you can see what you look like wearing, wearing totally different outfits just projected in the mirror. And you, there, there is even more to that because you see enchantment is a state of wonder, mm. right? 
And when, again, remember the ideal level is the most important one, right? So once we figure out the ideal level, uh, beautiful things start happening. So it, on, the, on the ideal level, what's really inspirational here is that uh, this is about returning wonder to technology, uh, returning wonder to uh, objects. And if you look around you, whoever is listening, if you look around you, look at how many dull industrial objects are surrounding you, right? We live in a disgusting time where we're surrounded by... Uh, uh, Black monoliths. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're surrounded by terrible design. Yeah. Uh, this, this terrible puritanic uh, 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 superficiality, right? Which is uh, also an artifact of the uh, industrial production line. Yeah. Right and of the lowest common common denominator of planned obsolescence. Yes, there you go. And uh, enchanted objects are denial of that because they allow you to modify how they behave. Right, they have the capacity to surprise you <laughs> because they leverage the entire internet at the end of the day. Right, um, they do not necessarily communicate in ways that uh, uh, we are used to. So you would have an object which, for example, will connect you to distant family members and will simply uh, glow uh, in, in an, for, the, for example, a glow blue whenever someone is mentioning your name on the other side of the planet, right? Um, so, you know, your, your distant family or colleagues or friends in Argentina are talking about you and suddenly, uh, you know, all the wine glasses, because you associated with, with them with wine, start, start glowing purple, right? <laughs> whatever. So it's it's... It brings this kind of uh, uh, strange otherworldliness to our everyday uh, and to, to the materiality surrounding us. And, and this is the enchantment, right? This is the, the capacity of wonder. And we've totally lost that when you think about it. Um, uh, our, so th- th- there are hints of it. Um, I'm a big fan of Netflix. I'm a big fan of YouTube and the recommendation system. In, in those um, platforms, they're not really devices, but but there's a there's I really get a kick out of when I log into YouTube and suddenly there's this new screen full of stuff that because I've watched something similar, this is saying you might like this, you should check this out. And I found really wacky, really weird stuff because the algorithms have been getting better and more interesting. See, algorithms eat data; they they eat and grow and become more beautiful, right, and elegant the more data they eat, right? They aggregate. <laughs> so uh, the more you feed them and the more you grow them, the better they get, right? Uh, but at the same time, the more dependent you are on them for these recommendations, the more they know about you. So it's a, this is a, um, I mean, some media theorists criticize this as a kind of empirical relationship. I disagree. Uh, th- this is a symbiotic relationship, mm. but uh, uh, it's, it's one uh, to which we are definitely not used. As soon as we start talking about this, I start thinking about Lewis Carroll and you know the characters in that book, uh, or, or or you know obviously Lord of the Rings. And I was about to say, I mean, if you want to understand the Internet of Things, read the Lord of the Rings. And, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Lewis Carroll, my my favorite, yes, and Lewis Carroll, and you know, go with C.S. Lewis as well. Uh, yes, <laughs> for good measure. The my favorite right. Internet of Things enchanted object is Thing. Uh, Bilbo Baggins' uh, uh, sword. It's uh, uh, and then later Frodo's sword. It it, it is uh, uh, enchanted objects because it, it reacts to to changes in the environment and it helps its uh, owner. But it has it, a mind of its own as well. The ring also. I mean. It, oh, the ring. Yes, I forgot. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special case. Okay, so last last topic then time scale. Um, uh, we've, 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 we've looked, we've, and you've mentioned some, some really interesting authors that we should check out, but there have been others like Alvin Toffler and Norbert Wiener who have pre- and Marshall McLuhan who have predicted massive change brought on by cybernetics and the human-machine relationship. But they were 50, 70, 100 years ahead of their time. What's the time scale we're talking about here? Uh, is it, you know, 10 years? Are we going to see change? 20, 50 I mean, oh. this is this is one of those questions where you know. I mean, it's very easy to say, yeah, in ten years, look, talk to me again in ten years. <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. But you know, it's uh, it's it's sometimes hard to wrap your mind around the fact that in two thousand and six, everyone thought that you know Nokia uh, is going to be the future, and Nokia is only gonna gonna get better. And then in two thousand and seven, the iPhone came out, and this entire reality just 
fell apart and disappeared and uh, and it's in the trash bin of history now and th- that's this is how disruptive uh, technological shifts and changes can be so uh, it is really hard to, to predict what uh, you know someone will develop five years down the track what I can uh, certainly say is that uh, there is a tremendous amount of investment and tremendous amount of research uh, and focus on uh, developing scalable uh, 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 hardware and scalable uh, applications which would uh, be permitting uh, the everyday. So there is a tremendous amount of interest in research in terms of uh, Internet of Things related fashion. So we're talking about clothes connecting to the Internet. Uh, um, and the real, uh, I mean, the, the, the jargon here, the tech jargon is killer application, right? Killer app. But uh, uh, another way of putting it, the real uh, uh, um, change vector here is uh, developing a meaningful way for clothes to talk to each other. So, uh, uh, I mean, I'm working with, with colleagues from uh, the Institute for Advanced Materials and from engineering on, uh, in, in uh, our university, University of Wollongong, on uh, something we call peer-to-peer clothing, which is, uh, and it's a conceptual problem first and technical problem second. So again, the idea level dominates. Uh, developing an understanding of how, uh, and on what terms, in terms of what protocols, in what context, in what settings, clothes will be talking to each other and will be creating meaningful uh, a change uh, uh, and meaningful kind of semantic uh, uh, applications for, for their humans. Right? Well, you know, remember, humans are secondary, right? Mm. The, the device is the primary. So, I mean, under what circumstances do you want your t shirt to be communicating with the people around you, right? Not necessarily visually, right? It can be visually, but it can be in terms of mild electrical uh, discharges, it can be in terms vibration. of color, it can be vibration, uh, it can be audio, uh, um, audio uh, uh, you know, it can be a, a, a tiny ping indicating that, you know, a friend or relative is, you know, within the 100 meter vicinity, whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, we're playing, we're toying with this idea that, you know, you would have uh, 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 clothes tribes, so people who form tribes based on clothing. Uh, so not just talking about fashion, but, See, but but the operation of fashion is a is a is a fun uh, is a function of uh, uh, the topology of clothing, if you will, right? So, um, and uh, of how the human is imagined and constructed, right? So, uh, um, yeah, the the challenge here, and there's tremendous amount of money being thrown at that right now, is to to develop this conceptual uh, parameter, the, the the framework within which. It would make sense to you to have your clothes constantly connected to the internet, right? And your clothes uh, either storing uh, uh, data locally or communicating with uh, clothes of people around you. Uh, I mean, and we're throwing all sorts of wild ideas there, and there's a lot of potential for for dramatic change, paradigmatic change. I mean, f- for example, one of my favorite ideas that we're working on right now is. Uh, um, um, you know, Bitcoin enabled clothes, right? Uh, it's uh, clothes which uh, use uh, this kind of distributed protocols uh, for communication, for storing data, uh, for storing uh, uh, value, for example, for exchanging value. Actually, right? actually, you know, doing computational blockchain work. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, because you know, uh, when when we talk of Internet of Things connected clothing, we're not talking about some huge physical physical uh, visible chunk of hardware hanging on a T-shirt. Yeah, we're not talking we're, about cyborgs and yeah. borgs. No, yeah. no, no, no. We're talking about carbon nanotubes, yeah. uh, which are completely invisible. We're talking about uh, powerful batteries the size of uh, uh, a nail, right? Which uh, are also uh, uh, completely flexible and a part of your clothing, uh, which you know capacitors distributed uh, around, uh, which are constantly being charged by your movement because as the you know your your t-shirt for example is uh, uh, entirely built out of uh, carbon nanotubes acting as antennas, which by moving right uh, you are weaving also piezoelectric crystals and by moving you're charging the capacitors, so your t-shirt is constantly fully charged. Right? And we're talking, it sounds science fictional, but the technology is already here. It just doesn't scale up yet. So to answer again your question, uh, 
My favorite scenario for the future is one where the Internet of Things spills into the everyday brutally uh, uh, with, with no mercy and forgiveness and forces us into a dramatic rethinking of uh, uh, how we imagine computing, how, how we imagine data, how we imagine communication. I, I, I'm, to wrap this up with the last topic, I promise, the, one of the topics that we're t returning to a lot in this subject is robotics and robots and the, the, the seemingly rapid rise of, of the presence of robots in our lives. Is the Internet of Things the necessary element in order for us to socialize with robots? Um, I imagine that, you know, voice control is only going to be so effective. We're going to need other ways of incorporating and being social with robots in our lives. Um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about hospitals, for example, where you have patients who aren't communicating, but they're communicating through other means, through breathing, through, through fluid in intake, outtake. You know, there's going to be a need for an Internet of Things in order for robots to become part of our lives. Uh, I'm going to totally detour your question now, <laughs> because again, remember, remember how we started that it's it's not about humans anymore. That's right, and I've got to get out of that paradigm. Uh, yeah. it's, it's almost it's really hard to escape it. I know, I know, I'm struggling with it as well. But my detour is not not actually it doesn't uh, end here. It's uh, uh, I I would say what is really challenging for us to imagine and and, and a definitely a potential development for the internet of things when it comes to for example your scenario imagine a, a person passing away but uh retaining a lot of their personality in terms of uh his or her uh, uh internet of things related objects mm. uh which is simply staying around and uh relentlessly performing that personality uh Imagine that. <laughs> I, I, I am. It's a kind of, it's an, an odd kind of immortality uh, or a continuation of life. It, it, again, it's, I, I just want to problematize because yeah, yeah. paradigm shifts when it comes to advent of radical technologies usually entail a, a dramatic shift in how we imagine uh, uh, ourselves uh, and reality in general. I mean, if you read, for me, endlessly fascinating topic, if you read 19th century uh, literature and 19th century uh, imaginaries of electricity, a gigantic paradigm shift. People suddenly was, started talking about spirits. And it was connected to yeah. the spirituality, yeah. the, the yeah. notion of the ether. There you go. And uh, why? Because it, people had their minds blown out Im immediately and constantly by uh, interaction with this invisible force. I mean, where, where, where is this coming from? Right? How this is it produced? Yeah. How are you doing that? And then the telegraph came in. So people started talking about voices in the ether, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, you know you, you had Holton coming in and, and talking about nerves spanning the globe, right? And and imagining the planet as a body, right? And, and talking about spirits as well. All of this because of electricity. So we are again in on the verge of uh, another paradigm shift, which is going to be more or less similar in terms of its impact on how we imagine ourselves. And this is why we keep coming back in this subject to futurology and science fiction and you know visions of the future, because that's how we imagine that these realities into being. Uh, this is really important, uh, a really important point to hammer uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, any and all audiences when it comes to uh, imaginaries and you know this kind of speculative fiction, if you will, and science fiction in particular, because uh, this is how you remodel and reframe the idea level, which, again, I will repeat myself again, informs all the other levels. Right? It sets the frame. Thank you, Ted, for joining us for a fascinating discussion on the Internet of Things. And thank you to those of you playing along at home or wherever you may be. This has been the Cyber Cultures podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks for listening, guys.